This is typical of the sort of clock movement found in clock towers, in churches and on public buildings all over the world. And the oldest of all manufacturers of tower clocks is based right here in Whitchurch. In fact, J.B. Joyce & Co. has been owned by seven generations of the same family of clockmakers spanning over 300 years, making it one of the oldest family firms of all time. Yeah, they originally started out at Cockshire, which is North Shropshire, in 1690, and they stayed there for quite a few years, and at that stage they were building uh, clocks for houses, internal clocks, grandfather clocks, that type of thing, and I presume then the business must have progressed quite well that in uh, 1790 they moved into the High Street in Whitchurch, and again they stayed there for a good number of years till they eventually moved to uh, where we are now in 1905. This was designed uh, by the Joyce family, by, I believe by a Manchester architect, uh, by the Joyce family, and it incorporated uh, many features which they needed to uh, build and test tower clocks. We've got the test bed, where, which involves a hole in the ground to allow the weights and the pendulum to project into it so that they, uh, the weights can run down and the clock can be tested over a number of days, weeks, and can be wound up. Uh, we started making the tower clocks in, in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, one of the early ones is, is uh, St Altman's Parish Church, which is still working today. It was made in 1849, and it takes the form of a chair frame design, which is basically, you can see, it is of a, a chair shape. Uh, there's three parts of the clock mechanism. The centre part is the time side, which drives the dials and then it drives up via connecting rods to the dials externally. You've then got the quarter chime, which is this side of the mechanism, and that chimes every quarter of an hour. And then over on the other side is the hour strike, which strikes the hour on the largest bell up in the belfry. And the clock needs to be wound uh, once a week. It goes for just over seven days, and I think it's usually wound on a Sunday, and it's wound with this large winding handle and it's wound by placing the handle on the winding square. And that was quarter past the hour. And then to keep the clock working while it's being wound, the maintaining power is lifted, and that keeps the clock working, and then the clock is wound. clock is wound like that every week, every Sunday morning, to keep it working. The British Parish clock was put in in 1849, and in 1950, I brought it out, the whole clock, the gears, the dial work, all up to the works here, I did it all up. Relined one bearing, because that was the only bearing that was worn. That's good clock making when that, you could only... And uh, polished and lacquered all the wheels, and it reinstated it. The main thing about it uh, that makes it a uh, bit special is that the arbors, that's these bars here, are high tensile steel. The gears are gunmetal gears, the bearings are gunmetal bearings, these are the bearings here, and the steel pinion, pinions here, these are silver steel, hardened and tempered, and you'll find very little wear in any of the teeth or the pinions of Joyce clocks. Everything pertaining to the clock, the cast iron, was cast locally at the foundry. The gears were cut in widgets. Pivots and arbors were made in Joyce's, in the lathes here. The pendulum ball was made at cast at the foundry. And what's always astounded me with this type of escapement, or any other escapement, the pendulum on this weighs 200 weight and this arm stopping on these stops 
We'll keep that pendulum going for about a hundred years. First impression was when I came here, but uh, <laughs> they'd gone back probably 40 years from when I left. In Scotland, I was working modern machines and they uh, were using modern tools in every way. When I came to Joyce's, my first job was to go up to the foundry and bring four or five foot cast iron dials down. And I borrowed a, a wooden truck with iron wheels from the foundry and we put the four cast iron wheels on and I brought them, pulled them all the way down from the foundry here. When I got them here, Norman said to me, right, he said, uh, they're going to be glazed. And before we put the putty in, we hold the glass in with copper pegs. So you've got uh, 36 holes to bore in each dial, an eighth of an inch in diameter, to hold the copper pegs. So I said to, said to him, well, where's the drill? Thinking he'd hand me an electric drill. No, he handed me a hand drill, and I said, where's the bit? So he gave me a piece of silver steel. He said, you make your own drill. So I take, heat the steel and beat it out and shape it for a drill. And it took me a day to do one dial. But I couldn't get through to Mr. Joyce that if I had an electric drill and I'd gone down to the showrooms, the, which was in the town, I could have bought a twist drill and I could have done the four dials in a day. But he wasn't interested in that. And you made your own to turning tools. Literally, you could honestly say that a Joyce clock was handmade. You filed all the brass wheels, the spokes, and uh, polished them. You made your own screws. Norman had the idea that if he had his own thread, nobody else could repair a Joyce clock. Consequence to the high standards of craftsmanship, the extreme reliability and timekeeping that was accurate to within a second or two a week, Joyce's clocks were the first choice for cathedrals, churches and public buildings all over the country. Joyce's Eastgate clock in Chester is said to be the second most photographed clock in the world, after Big Ben of course. The largest Joyce's Tower clock in the UK is the one in the 325-foot tower of Birmingham University. It's known locally as Old Joe, although officially it's the Joseph Chamberlain Memorial. Each of the four faces is 5.3 metres across, and the minute hands are each over 3 metres long. It's accurate to within a few seconds a month. Joyce's tower clocks appear on public buildings all around the world. The largest clock that they ever made was for the Shanghai Customs House. Known as Big Ching, the clock chimes, which are the same as the Whitchurch chimes, are used for broadcast, just as Big Ben is over here. The four faces for the Shanghai clock are each five and a half metres in diameter and are beautiful creations glazed with some 2,000 pieces of white and amber glass. The clock was completely dismantled for shipment to Shanghai and sent from Whitchurch Railway Station. The total of all the packages weighed 30 tonnes. On arrival at Shanghai, the clock was assembled under the personal supervision of Mr Norman Joyce, who was away for the project for a total of six months. 
Interestingly, the company books for 1927 show that the company actually made a loss on this prestigious timepiece. Joyce's were successful in winning contracts with all the major rail operating companies to provide station clocks. There were hundreds of them up and down the country, and they established a reputation for accuracy and reliability. The Carnforth station clock was made famous by the 1945 film Brief Encounter. They didn't just make clocks either. Well, the sundials, I was quite surprised in the first place. It got slow and fast on one part of it. It had got the months of the years and the days of the week and the date all on the outside, and they were about, I would say, oh, 18 inches in diameter. They were quite large, and they were very, very strong, very thick. And they were all engraved, beautifully engraved, and a, a nice star engraving in the centre. Yeah, in the, in, the, in the late 1950s and early 60s, um, they, I think, kept reasonably busy, but things were, I think, starting to decline, from what I can understand, in that um, they probably didn't change with the modern uh, designs that were coming on board. Um, we'd always made mechanical clocks which were hand-wound, and they were the thing that everybody wanted and needed for a long, long period of time. But as things got better with the electrical supply throughout the country, um, people wanted... Um, clocks that they didn't necessarily need to wind every week so other companies were, were producing electric clocks which were at the time state-of-the-art which we r didn't really develop into um, and Norman Joyce who was the last of the Joyce family um, was was at, getting towards retirement there was a fire in the building which which took the whole roof off and he wasn't insured and one or two other things and then in 1965 he sold out to uh, John Smith and Sons clockmakers from Derby who we start, who were still p part of. We now cover from Southport uh, through to Stoke-on-Trent all the way down to the south coast including Devon, Cornwall, Dorset. We do uh, servicing on, on an annual basis uh, within that area for church clocks, public clocks, clocks on private houses we also do restoration work on the actual mechanisms themselves as well as uh, dial restorations using either scaffolding or rope access. We look after, as a group, we look, we service every year throughout the UK and Ireland uh, over 4,500 clocks and that's just an annual one visit per year. As a group we employ just over 60 people and based at the JB Joyce office, we've got two office staff, myself included, and five engineers that are either in the workshop or out on the road carrying out the other work. Whatever they made, it was made of the best materials, always. And they used to spend the time making sure that Norman Joyce would say, if you asked him, how long you would guarantee it for, he'd guarantee it for a hundred years, and he meant it. <laughs> <laughs>